may I ask, also nature positivity is a fairly new term which has become more popular in recent months. May I just ask into the group who of you has already come across that term and knows what it's about? Two, three. Okay, so it's uh, the vast minority of you and we will provide you in the next 60 minutes uh, of a definition of what nature positi positivity means and also how your company can benefit from becoming nature positive. And if there's two takeaways I would like you to take home today, then it is number one, what really matters is not your carbon footprint as a company, what really matters is your environmental footprint. And the second takeaway is eventually what it's all about when you talk about nature, it's about quality, quality, quality. So it's really about the substance of projects you get involved in and you finance. And we would like to talk you through that, why that is the case. Um, but let's start with a quick introduction. My name is Jerome, I'm uh, the co-founder of Good Carbon, a fairly young startup here in Berlin. We are two years old and I'm joined by Ricarda, who heads our business development and is employee number one <laughs> after the co-founders. Now, you will wonder, what do we do? What is Good Carbon about? And uh, the name uh, carries carbon uh, already in the name, but what we offer is a climate and nature action platform. So we enable companies to not only become net zero, which I guess most of you can put a definition on, but we help companies also to become nature positive. And we offer three different things because the customers and the clients of ours approach us with the first question, which is, hey guys, what is nature positivity? How does it fit with my climate agenda? And how can I set a strategy in the field of nature, which is also credible? How can I set a strategy in that field which goes along with my entire environmental footprint? And how can I put this into action by investing into high quality nature-based solution projects? So we are talking about not uh, uh, empty airports, but we are talking about projects in the space of forest, in the space of regenerative agriculture, and in the space of ocean. Yeah? So we help them with our intelligence to define a strategy, number one. Number two, we provide a platform to take action. A platform to invest into high-quality nature-based solution projects, again in those three important ecosystems, and today we have 10 million other, by the way, in the form of carbon credits, which is a much disputed topic, and we will talk about today why it's great to have carbon credits, but we offer on the platform access to 10 million carbon credits from projects around the world, which enable companies to not only become net zero, but also nature positive. And number three, and that's uh, especially for enterprises important, that we also uh, provide the software to manage the entire portfolio, and most importantly, to address the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is scope three, which is the emissions which you basically get delivered onto your uh, shop floor by your suppliers and the emissions which are caused by your customers. And we allow companies through our software to also address those 80% of emissions which companies have today. Now, some of our partners who we work with, that you um, uh, understand that we serve big enterprises, but uh, also smaller startups and also uh, the German Mittelstand, which has their own set of challenges and requirements, um, but the three services which we offer and products cater to all of these. Now, Maybe after the quick introduction, uh, Jerome asked you before who actually knows what nature positivity means. And this is one what we're going to start with to explain what nature positivity means and also why should I actually care? Why does it matter? 
So maybe starting with the second part of this question, why should I care? Why does it matter? Because if you read the news today, if you read through the sustainability strategies of large companies, you see the topic of climate everywhere. Everybody is talking about global warming, climate warming, uh, especially in Germany. There's this ongoing debate about the Klima, Kleber, that you probably have heard lots about in the newspaper. But what is less talked about in the newspaper is starting to emerge now and in the media is actually that the climate climate crisis, it's not an isolated crisis and it also cannot be solved on its own. We're not going to achieve net zero without nature. That's a fact that's scientifically proven and that's why there's also the second uh, big crisis that is actually going on, which is the loss of nature and biodiversity crisis. The topic has become a bit more prominent with the COP15, uh, which is the same as the COP27, but not for climate, but for biodiversity, which was the first time that countries and the UN um, actually decided on a common goal, not only for climate, but also for biodiversity. But uh, many scientists actually say that the biodiversity crisis is much more urgent and needs to be addressed much more urgent because uh, it, is, uh, it is closely interlinked actually with the climate crisis. Nature is our largest carbon sink that we have and global warming keeps destroying nature and therefore re-emitting carbon into the atmosphere, which again then fosters this loss of nature. So we need to address both at the same time and not just on a global level, but also on a company level. And then there's also a third part to the equation, so to say, which is global inequality. Because if we look at the global south, which is already at a disadvantage today, this is the region that is going to be impacted and hit first by not only climate warming, but also by the loss of nature, because they are directly dependent on nature for their income. Oops. Um, so if we look at a couple of numbers, as also shown on the slides before, and if we kind of look at the status that nature and biodiversity is in right now, we can see that one million of the eight million species that are around globally are actually threatened with extinction. That 75% uh, of our global surface on land has already been modified by human beings and human interactions, especially in the global north, but also more starting now in the global south. And then uh, that also 80% of our 85% uh, of the wetlands have been lost. But we still often get the question, why, like still, why does it matter for me as a company? Why do I need to care about this as on a company level? And um, I really like this figure. It looks a bit complex. But um, what you can see here are the 17 SDGs uh, that uh, probably most of you are a bit familiar with. And what this nicely shows is actually that uh, climate and also nature, so life on Earth and also life underwater, is the basis for any other SDG that is out there. So if you want to have any chance of achieving any kind of social or also economic SDG, we need to fix the basis first. And the basis is climate and it's nature. So that's why it's super important. And if you look again a bit in terms of numbers, uh, it actually um, there are uh, different studies that show that 50% of our global GDP is either directly or indirectly or directly uh, dependent on nature. So that's why it's also super important for any kind of companies. And um, there are some obvious industries which are more dependent on nature than others. But um, in this graph, you can also see that there are also some of the industries that are a bit less obvious that actually are very dependent in the, not only in their own operations, but also in their supply chain when it comes to nature. So the obvious ones are food and beverages, tobacco, probably most of you can imagine, because Agriculture is one of the biggest drivers for biodiversity loss and also for GHG emissions, but also industries like aviation, retail and consumer goods, and also the automotive industries are dependent on nature for their long-term success. So that's why it's actually relevant for any company, and every company should think about not only what carbon footprint they have, but also what environmental footprint they have. So what can I actually do to address this? And now we come to this term, nature positivity. So um, if we look at the science-based target initiative, which is the mo uh, most widely recognized standards for companies to set net zero uh, targets, then we can see, I think, uh, I, I checked like last week, and I think it was almost 5,000 companies that have committed to setting uh, short-term reduction targets or also net zero targets. But if you, you can really go beyond that, 
And there's a sister organization that we're also going to talk about in a second, which is the Science-Based Target Network. And what the Science-Based Target Network does, it helps companies to set science-based target for nature and helps them to contribute to a nature-positive environment. So what nature-positive means is because it's different to, to uh, net zero, because when it comes to climate, it is enough if we just come to zero. But with nature, it's actually not enough if we just come to zero, because we have already destroyed so much. So here, we actually we need to do more. We need to actively restore more. So it's not just fine to reduce your impact, but you actually need to have a net positive impact on nature. So restore more than you actually destroy. And, um, the goal um, that some of uh, many companies have agreed to is to uh, get there by 2030, hopefully to the net zero, and then afterwards continue to a net positive journey afterwards. I talked about the SBTN just a minute before. These are all companies that have signed up. So some of the biggest players globally, they are already committed to setting science-based target for nature and also to uh, contribute to a nature-positive environment. Um, so and now it's basically upon also the smaller companies to follow and every single company to actually follow and also uh, think about what they can do beyond just becoming net zero. If we look again at a couple of numbers, then we can see that more than 80% of the Fortune 500 companies today have set science-based target, uh, science tar science -based targets for, uh, for our climate, but not for nature. So there is this really urgent need, and we need to increase also awareness that it's not just enough to focus on climate, but that you actually need to move beyond. I think the reasons we just uh, need to, uh, we showed before, and this is uh, why we're here, uh, because we also want to uh, kind of spread the word here to kind of talk about why it is so important and uh, increase the urgency to uh, also set science-based target for nature and actually become not just net zero, but nature positive. There's also a regulatory side to things. Um, maybe some of you are a bit familiar with the new regulation that is coming up, um, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which will uh, become effective in 2024. The EU taxonomy is already partly active um, and will also expand its, um, its scope uh, in the upcoming years. Uh, and there, um, increasing transparency will be mandated by companies, not just on climate, but also on biodiversity, on freshwater usage, on marine water uh, resources, on uh, pollution and lots of other topics. So every company will have to deal with this topic. They cannot hide and they cannot shy away from it. Everybody will need to determine their impact that they have not only on climate, but on biodiversity and some of the other um, uh, dimensions I just mentioned. So this will not just be uh, something that you can uh, just uh, deal with it for because for the fun of it, but you actually have to from the regulatory pressure. Yeah, and I just um, maybe want to give uh, a big perspective on how slow change typically happens. Um, so what Ricarda has just shown is um, a requirement from the European Union for companies, for 50,000 companies and more, because it will also concern their suppliers, to essentially report on the impact they have on nature. And this reporting directive will become effective with the reporting year 2024. So typically, if you look at how long it takes for a company or how long it takes for a new accounting standard to get into uh, activation, it typically takes seven years. And typically, those new accounting rules, which hit companies' uh, financial reporting, are an evolution and not a revolution. Then, you know, it's a new way of reporting inventory. This is essentially a revolution because it requires companies to understand all of a sudden something which they have, in most cases, no clue about, right? So uh, we asked initially how many people have heard about nature positivity. There were maybe three of you, right? Now, the question is probably after Ricarda's uh, uh, chapter, how many people really realize that it's not a nice to have, it's moving from beauty to duty to act on nature. We'll probably see a couple of more arms going up, but what will be the truth in, in one year time is that companies will need to report on that matter, right? So I guess our call to action is take it home, yeah? take it in your company, uh, and also raise awareness uh, for really uh, understanding uh, your indirect and direct dependency on nature and what you can give back. 
Now, the question is, how can nature-based solutions help on that matter? And Ricardo spoke about the three problems which we have today. The problem of a climate crisis, we all speak about global warming. The problem of a nature crisis, in the sense that we are losing uh, species, we are losing uh, habitat, and eventually also of global inequality. A nature-based solution, so restoring our forest, restoring our oceans, restoring uh, our um, soil by moving to regenerative agriculture can have impact on three dimensions. Number one, it can decarbonize the atmosphere at scale. So the pathway to the 1.5 degree uh, warming target is to remove 50 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere every year. 10 billion can come in one shape or the other from nature-based solutions. Yeah? So nature-based solutions is a massive, massive lever to decarbonize the atmosphere. Technical removal is typically in the area of 3 billion tons. But it is the only lever which we have which can decarbonize and which can also um, restore and protect biodiversity, right? And biodiversity, it's a word, right? But if you put it into practice, it's local, it's complex, uh, it's different everywhere, right? It's not a ton of CO2, it's a complex beast, but it's the only measure which can really restore biodiversity. And eventually, if those projects are implemented properly, they also come with benefits for the local communities and income for local communities. So companies have to follow, as on the climate journey, the mitigation hierarchy. Stop, uh, obviously, destroying nature. Uh, avoid the destruction of nature. But if, uh, basically, they can't do differently, they have to also take their share in rebuilding uh, nature by investing into nature-based solutions. And, and the good news is you can kill two birds with one stone, even though it's a bad saying maybe in that context. But the good news is many of you have already started, uh, your companies have already started uh, to move and to progress on the net zero journey. The good news is by investing into nature-based solutions, you can also move into the second wave, which will uh, hit all of us gladly, yeah, which is also uh, to become nature positive. Yeah? So by investing, by restoring, by investing into those projects, you can not only help uh, your own uh, net zero agenda, but also your nature positivity agenda. And we'll see how. Now, the good news is also, obviously, you will fulfill the requirements of your investors. You all know Article 9, Article 8, you know, complicated stuff in uh, regulation of capital. Yeah? So capital can't just invest anymore anywhere. Basically, Article 8 and Article 9 funds will select in whom they invest. That's the reason why many companies which are publicly listed move already on that front. You will fulfill customer requirements. Uh, uh, the pressure at the point of sale is increasing massively and by the way not only from consumers but also in the supply chain from uh, B2B and eventually Ricarda touched upon it it will allow you to respond to the requirements of the uh, EU taxonomy and the CSRD yeah? which uh, I invite you to read those interesting uh, outlines on that matter uh, which are quite complex um, and um, yeah, difficult to, to address. Now, what is nature-based solutions? We touched upon those three uh, ecosystems, forest, soil, and ocean. Uh, it goes one level deeper, and I'm not going to go the full detail of that, but think about a coffee producer who is uh, producing coffee and who is uh, transforming uh, its coffee farm into agroforestry. Uh, also a way to um, uh, capture additional carbon. Uh, the move from uh, classical agriculture to a regenerative form of agriculture where you capture carbon and make uh, the soil also much more resistant and uh, the basis for more uh, biodiversity. Uh, different forms of rice cultivation, reforestation uh, of forests, but also moving into the oceans, which is a fantastic way of uh, protecting also coastlines, which are mangrove forests. Yeah? So there are different forms uh, of ecosystems in different parts of the world, which also, by the way, help companies to match what their own value chain footprint and environmental footprint look like and give a way to make meaningful um, investments um, uh, along your environmental footprint. 
So now we talked about what nature positivity means and also how nature-based solutions can help. But probably for most of you, it's still not entirely clear what should I do now if I'm a company, what can I do? So um, here are a few steps that you can follow to uh, get to net zero, but then also to get to net, uh, nature positive. So the first step is obviously to, first of all, measure your impact. Um, and um, then also follow the mitigation hierarchy. So we're not just saying that you can buy your way off by just investing into nature-based solutions, but you need to follow the hierarchy, which says, first of all, avoid your emissions if possible. If you cannot avoid it, on also your nature uh, impact, if you cannot avoid it, try to reduce it as much as possible. And then only as a third step, you should compensate. But your impact that you have uh, on um, GHG emissions, but also on nature is obviously cannot be reduced from today until tomorrow. So it's important that you also do this additional step to additionally compensate while uh, reducing your emissions. And you shouldn't just have like any target uh, that you are not really sure about how you can achieve it, but you should really implement science-based targets. What does it mean is that you really have a clear pathway and clear strategies on how are you going to get to net zero and also to nature positive. Uh, I mentioned the science-based target initiative earlier. This is uh, one framework that companies can use that help companies to set science-based targets so that you actually have a clear pathway and it's not just some far away target that you have no idea about how I can reach it. Uh, and there's also the SPTN, which we will touch upon in a second. Then the second step is that uh, when it comes to compensation is that you should care about what kind of project it is and it should actually fit to the impact that you have across your value chain. So if you are, for example, we had the example before of a coffee producer. If you're a coffee producer uh, and you want to compensate your emissions, it probably doesn't make sense if you uh, invest into a mangrove project because it has nothing to do with your value chain and also nothing to do with uh, kind of your core operations. But you can invest into agroforestry projects which are very much aligned with what you're doing because you have a huge impact coming from uh, agroforestry. And you can also invest into afforestation projects because one of the key drivers in many food producing uh, um, industries is actually deforestation because they deforest land to make room for agricultural land. So these are projects that kind of match your footprint. And then thirdly, obviously, you also need to ensure the quality of the project. Uh, because um, maybe some of you have followed the topic a bit uh, in the news over the last couple of months. There are a lot of carbon projects which do not really deliver the impact that they promise. So it's really important to deep dive on the quality aspect. Um, and then also uh, be clear about what you communicate. Do not make any false promises. Be very transparent in the way that you communicate what you have achieved and what you haven't achieved. Because otherwise you're going to have a very high chance of being accused of greenwashing if you just put a label of climate neutral on everything. Um, so for a lot of companies, it's very clear how can I set science-based targets for um, their CO2 emissions, that they need to um, measure their CO2 emissions, but not only from their own operations, and the same actually also goes um, for nature, but across the whole value chain. So a lot of companies say we are carbon neutral, but they're actually only carbon neutral in their own operations, meaning scope one and scope two, which account for maybe 10% of the total emissions that they have, which is obviously misleading. So you need to look at the whole cycle starting from your raw materials over uh, the manufacturing of your products and services over distribution, the usage, which is also very important. So you do not only have uh, emissions and impact on nature upstream in your value chain, but also downstream with the way that people use your products and use your services. Uh, and then lastly, also the end use of it when it comes to recycling. So you need to have an and you need to identify where do I have an impact, not only in terms of CO2 emissions, but also in terms of nature. So you have to look at where do I have an impact on land use, for example? Where do I have an impact on resource exploitation, uh, on pollution? Um, where do I maybe uh, somehow introduce invasive species in my value chain without even knowing that I actually do so? Um, 
this is a framework from the science-based target network that companies can use to very easily get a first understanding of where are actually my pressure points. So where is where uh, am I dependent on nature and also where do I have an impact on nature. So you can look this up. They also just published their first science-based target for nature on freshwater um, to get this really in-depth understanding. But um, there are the different categories that I just named, it's basically you, can, uh, you should identify, identify where do I have these pressure points across land, freshwater, and ocean across these different categories to get an understanding of where does it make sense for me also to spend my money when it comes to compensating my carbon to match this with the environmental footprint and the environmental pressure points that I have identified in this analysis. Uh, again, the first step should obviously always be to reduce your impact. Um, there are, uh, and this counts not only for emission reductions, but also for nature impact. So uh, companies should additionally also set uh, targets to, uh, for example, commit to zero deforestation, meaning that uh, no longer forests are going to be cut down to make room for something else. Um, that you can reduce your fresh water usage. There was a great talk from L'Oreal um, uh, in the morning that talked about how they recycle water and also how they reduce the fresh water usage in producing um, their uh, cosmetic products. Um, also uh, reducing obviously value chain emissions and also um, a huge impact actually that has an impact on um, biodiversity, soil health and also uh, GHG emissions is for example uh, just using not only traditional fertilizers and chemical fertilizers anymore in agriculture, but switching to more natural fertilizers. Yeah, hello. <laughs> Let's maybe uh, get back to the two takeaways which um, I uh, or we envisioned you to uh, to take home today. The first one was. Is it really the carbon footprint which matters or is it the environmental footprint? And we try to bring across that it is the environmental footprint for various reasons, not only for uh, regulatory reasons, because, uh, but also because your value chain in most cases is just dependent on nature. Yeah? Your productivity of the, your company is in many cases directly or indirectly dependent on nature. Now what we would like to focus on now is also how quality matters, right? And uh, how you can identify projects which meet the standards and which also help really you to align your value chain and your environmental footprint with the projects you get engaged with. And uh, as we said earlier, there are two ways to get engaged in that matter. The one is you simply do what you in most cases already do today but you upgrade, right? In most cases, your company is already today engaged in buying carbon credits, right? And there's a parallel uh, stream uh, over there, which is talking uh, about the poor quality, uh, basically, of carbon credits, rightfully so, right? Because carbon credits in the past have not always delivered on the promise uh, which they have given, right? But they can because there are fantastic projects out there which already issue carbon credits today. So you can, on your agenda to becoming net, uh, nature positive, already leverage your investments into nature via your carbon credits, but you have to ensure you invest into projects which are fantastic. Then there's a second wave of um, actions which are becoming available for you as a company, which are specific ways to address biodiversity, specific ways to address water, specific ways to address pollution in the form of uh, respective credits for those ecosystem services. This is probably 12 months down the road, right? There are first ways of uh, basically uh, first examples on the market, but the message is you can use already your engagement in nature-based solutions, but you have to pay respect to quality. Why? A, because you want to do something meaningful, and B, because there is a big reputational risk. You have seen Delta Airlines just being accused of a one billion fine in the US for basically greenwashing, right? The Green Claims Directive is another example of companies just claiming uh, basically a, um, uh, a neutrality or an environmental impact which is simply not true uh, on a net net basis, right? So the risk, the reputational risk which comes along with uh, your involvement also into projects which are of poor quality is quite massive. And how we help with that, right, <laughs> this is uh, the uh, a bit the um, promotion on that front, is we 
run a very de very detailed due diligence on nature-based solution projects. So all the projects on our platform are pre-validated by one of the leading standards, Vera, Gold Standard, Plan Vivo, Cerca Bono and the likes. But as we have seen in the scandals in the past, just uh, six months ago, they are not always able to differentiate good from bad. So what we do is basically we look at 150 criteria along impact, risk and integrity to ensure that we only select the AAA projects from that market. And when it comes to impact, it's not only about the carbon sequestration impact, it's about biodiversity impact and it is about the social impact those projects have on the ground. And we make that assessment transparently available and also quantified that you can basically analyze price, uh, the pricing of those projects, right? Does the pricing correspond to the attributes which the project claims, which today is almost impossible if you two take two projects which basically claim uh, the same thing, right? It's very hard to get to the bottom of things, right? And we have a team which is dedicated to that topic, biologists uh, and the likes, which are uh, analyzing those projects. What we allow companies to do with this detailed analysis is to match it to their value chain and to their environmental footprint. And a publishing house which is buying books from suppliers where they don't know where the paper is coming from and where the, the, the forests are, where the, where the wood um, has, has been taken from, um, they have a different footprint than a company which is uh, in the space of telecommunication, then a company which is in professional services, then a company which is uh, in uh, oil and gas <laughs> extraction. We don't work with oil and gas, but uh, the environmental footprint with, uh, of companies is different, and hence this liability which companies have has to be matched with the assets they get involved, right? And the assets in that case are the nature-based solution projects, which also carry different characteristics. It's not about CO2 sequestration alone. It's also about uh, the ability uh, on water uh, capturing, the ability on biodiversity restoration. So it's a data-driven matchmaking for companies to address their environmental footprint and not only their carbon footprint. And that basically protects also companies against accusations of greenwashing uh, because it's all quantified and transparent. Now we have built up a fantastic portfolio as we think of projects across the globe, um, more than 10 million in that case carbon credits available but always carbon credits which come also with biodiversity and social impact and uh, they are from, you can't see the map but there's a map, the world map yeah, <laughs> with Africa and uh, Asia and um, uh, 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 Latin America and South America. Uh, we also have projects from the global north, yeah, so from Germany, uh, regenerative agriculture and also forests. So you can mix and match uh, to the uh, requirements and also your company's geographical footprint because most of your companies are not only in Berlin, but they are most, in most cases globally dispersed. Now to summarize uh, and maybe um, the, uh, the, the call to action and then we can uh, move into Q&A if there are some. So we help companies not only on their way to become net zero, we also help companies on the way to address their environmental footprint, which is really what matters and hence to progress uh, on the way to becoming nature positive. And very importantly, to respond to the pressures which companies get from a regulatory perspective starting for the Berichtsjahr 2024, the reporting year 2024, uh, which uh, has to be uh, basically addressed in the beginning of 2025. Yeah? So we help companies to address that matter. And what is important when you get active in the space of nature, it's quality and the ability to understand the impact you're promoting on the ground because nature is real and it is basically touching people and impacting people and hence we uh, would really like to drive for this call to action to really understand what you do and to be engaged with those projects ideally in the long term by investing into carbon credits, by investing into biodiversity credits and we have our little booth over there, yeah, behind this cubicle and very happy to uh, speak to you afterwards and to address, address any questions which you might have. Does anybody have any questions right now? Then uh, we are also happy to answer them uh, as best as possible. Thank you very much, Ricarda, Jerome.
do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for such an informative uh, presentation. Uh, in one of the slides, you mentioned uh, there was a graph that shows uh, uh, net zero and net positive, where the graph goes. So why there is a gap between net zero and net positive? I mean, this is basically just a, like an illustration, but basically net zero means that you, first of all, you reach zero, and then if you want to reach net positive, then you have to kind of get slightly above this like zero line, basically, to actually have this net positive impact. Okay. And one more question. Uh, so what is the measure for uh, nullifying a company's uh, biodiversity pollution or uh, water pollution? Because from a carbon perspective, I know it is in the form of tonnage of carbons, uh, carbon dioxide that's released. But what is in terms of biodiversity, land use, water? Well, that's, um, I guess, exactly the problem, that there is not one single measure, but there are tons of measures out there, right? Uh, it can be as simple as the uh, uh, hectare of degraded land which you uh, impact. Uh, it can be uh, basically the amount of water which you are polluting. Uh, it can be, also typically, uh, it's flora and fauna, right? And uh, how you impact species and, and habitat. Um, but your impact towards that is the pollution you bring uh, into the uh, into the world, the amount of water you are using and you are basically using for your production, uh, the amount of resources you are extracting in a non-regenerative manner from uh, from uh, from the ground, um, and. The impact you have on that, on biodiversity, is one which differs. Maybe Ricardo, you want to you want to contribute uh, to the answer, but which differs really by by ecosystem, right, and how you measure it. Because it's not only the the you know the uh, diversity of species, for example. It's also the quantity of species which matter. Yeah, and we don't have necessarily a diversity problem of species. We have also a quantity problem of species. If you think, for example, about uh, 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 yes, bean, other bees. Yeah, and uh, this bees example is always a bit uh, strange because people think bees, but why are bees important? Well, without bees, you don't eat, right? Because you don't have any agriculture because nothing grows. And uh, eventually, this quantity problem is one which is uh, which is quite quite important. Um, well, that was a long answer, which was not very precise, but Ricarda maybe. I, th I think you basically cover it. It's in, in terms of biodiversity, there are various different measures. There's also a lot of innovation that is happening. There's a new concept called environmental DNA that lots of companies are working on to really uh, kind of summarize different KPIs into one single KPI and have a better understanding of the degradation of a land, for example, and also kind of the uh, healthiness of land. Um, and um, it, it, it depends on basically what kind of biodiversity you want to measure. Um, and we are all very eager to actually find out what the EU will eventually determine as the key KPIs uh, to report upon uh, with the CSRD. Got it. Thank you. Hi. Just a quick question regarding the critical sort of stance about like the VERA certification and all the other certification have faced massive scrutiny over the past uh, couple of months. How do you ensure that those basically certifications really hit the sweet spot, right, and really have impact? Because I feel like that even those standards cannot be trusted um, due to the scrutiny over the past few weeks. Well, the, uh, the reason we exist is exactly that this scrutiny is needed. Yeah, so that's really why good, why we have created good carbon, because we feel that the standards, we feel it's a, uh, it's a fact, right, that the standards are not able to differentiate good from bad. They set a minimum standard in terms of following a certain methodology, uh, but uh, a regenerative, uh, also a mo removal project uh, can be a monoculture, which, you know, after the monoculture has grown, nothing grows there anymore, right? Or it can be a really an ecosystem which is flourishing for itself for decades. And how we do this, maybe you want to, to comment? Yeah, and, but maybe just one more comment. There is a massive misconception in the market that is, like, 
slightly getting better is that standards actually ensure quality, which is not the case. We still hear it a lot of the times from companies um, and that uh, are saying, oh, but I want to have a project which has a VARO standard and which has a CCB certification because they believe then the projects are really, really good in terms of biodiversity. And then you look at the project and it's a monoculture eucalyptus plantation, which is terrible when it comes to biodiversity. So we really need to look at the project itself. Um, and um, we have briefly shown this framework that we have when it comes to impact, risk, and integrity. And um, you need to uh, basically capture different uh, data sources that are available. So we obviously also take the data sources from the projects and that the projects publish. But we also um, use different GIS data, so different remote sensing satellite data to also check the baselines of the projects and really the kind of the scientific basis of the calculation for carbon, but also the impact that they have on certain other dimensions and really trying to reduce this risk as, as much as possible. And um, there are also some rating agencies out there uh, nowadays that are trying to also uh, reduce and assess the, the risk of the projects. Um, but we also make this assessment we do transparently available so you can actually understand what we have done and understand yourself why the project is actually high quality and also compare it uh, to other projects. I have a question for you, Jerome. Say you have company A and company B operating in the same industry, competitors, and they each set their own science-based targets. How do you tell who is more net positive than the other when, say, company A is doing the bare minimum? Well, I guess, um, I mean, the, the, the notion of science-based targets is that it's backed by science, right? So uh, if both companies set their science-based targets following the SPTI methodology and basically setting near-term, mid-term and long-term targets, then you know fairly well, although you can compare, right, where they stand on their journey by just looking up uh, their CO2 report, their sustainability uh, reporting, right? This is true on the climate, on the, on the climate agenda, right? On the nature positivity agenda, I would say it's almost impossible today, right? Because companies, they basically claim certain things in their, uh, uh, you know, in the reporting which they do today. But the reason the European Union has basically revised and came up with the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, because they uh, exactly want to address the problem that companies are not accountably reporting against specific dimensions like biodiversity, like pollution, like climate uh, change uh, mitigation, like uh, water usage and uh, impact on the oceans. And only once we have this reporting in place, we can also, uh, I would say, objectively compare the progress of companies on the nature agenda. Right. So that's what well, Thank you. Any other questions? You mentioned the new um, requirements from European Union uh, that are valid from 2024 on. Um, what the, do they exactly say and for which company size they are valid? So the first wave is uh, uh, for uh, publicly listed companies and also large um, private companies. But then in 2025, 2026, 2027, it will be uh, also relevant for SMEs and also smaller size companies. And um, so there are two regulations. There's the EU taxonomy, which requires companies to report their share of revenue, their share of CAPEX and also their share of OPEX that is aligned with the EU taxonomy. And to, in order to be aligned with the EU taxonomy, you need to um, basically achieve uh, different targets, which are climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, uh, biodiversity uh, protection, um, circular economy, um, uh, marine and, and freshwater usage, so there's certain targets. This is just about like reporting these three KPIs. And then there's the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, um, which um, becomes effective in 2024 for, for, for the larger companies, but then also for the smaller ones. And they also require companies to first do a materiality assessment to identify the kind of the dependencies and pressure points and impacts that they have. And then uh, like, uh, based on this analysis to report also on different dimensions. So as a first thing, it's a transparency on what impact they actually have. But then they also need to report the actions that they take 
to kind of contribute to these environmental targets that the EU have to find, being the ones I just mentioned, climate change mitigation, adaptation, biodiversity, and so on. What sort of challenges do you face in convincing companies? You showed us quite a bit of list, but what challenges do you face in convincing companies to focus on net positivity? Um, well, I guess companies went through this first wave, right? Where they said, okay, I'm committing towards becoming uh, net zero, right? And today, 90% of the economy has pledged, right? Uh, measured in, in, in value, has pledged to become uh, net zero. Now, this um, rethinking of uh, and this um, realization that nature is not only nice for a walk on the weekend, but that nature is a productivity factor and that nature is basically something I need to care about, I need to restore, is something which you know, takes time until it gets into the thinking of corporates. And once they have realized, and Ricardo has showed the numbers, right? 90% of, men, of, the, of uh, Fortune 500 companies recognize the need for climate action, but only a, a fraction of that recognize the need for uh, nature action, right? So there's a realization in the heads of uh, companies, and then there's obviously the momentum to get your organization moving. And this is like if you are a construction company, like the biggest construction company in the world, or cement uh, concrete production, they all of a sudden take care of biodiversity. And we had the question earlier, I mean, they are all over the place in the world, and biodiversity is not biodiversity. So there's also a knowledge gap, which is massive on a company side, to essentially go through this uh, cycle of creating transparency, understanding your environmental impact, and then you have to get to the action point. So I think uh, the, biggest, uh, co uh, the, the biggest factor which we are facing is simply time, right? Because companies are going through that process of change and realization and then uh, the lack of uh, knowledge and the need for help, I would say. Sounds great. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what is the incentive? Because um, earlier on, in the day, we spoke about the challenges that companies face with investing to become net zero. Now they need to invest again in net positivity. So what is the incentive? Would you say like the biggest? Yeah. I mean, we just kind of try to explain that you can address both at the same time, right? I mean, yeah. they obviously need to address, like, invest into decarbonization. But if they have set net zero targets, then they will need to rely on removals to kind of get this kind of rest out of the atmosphere. And then they can, they don't have to double spend, but uh, they can actually use the same money to get to net zero then also to nature positive. But I think kind of the incentive is that they have to because they are dependent on nature. If I'm a, if I'm a coffee producer and going to hear from Melita um, just after this talk, who's also a, a customer of ours, is then they are directly dependent on nature for their business because they, they, they source coffee. And if they are not able to kind of manage this shift from conventional agriculture to agroforestry, then they are not going to have a business in 20 years' time. So they, they, they just simply have to. There's no other option. I mean, you have to realize just on this coffee example, and maybe uh, Stefan will talk about that, most regions which are producing coffee today in the world, if climate change continues the way it does at the moment, will not produce coffee anymore in 10 or 15 years, right? Simply because the, the, uh, the climate is not given, the biodiversity is not given, and that's a massive, I mean, this is, a, uh, this is putting companies out of business, right? I mean, it can put companies out of business, and I think that's really the, uh, the main motivation. 50% of the economy is directly or indirectly dependent on nature. And, you know, for me personally, it was a process of really understanding it, because for agriculture, you understand it immediately, right? For fishery, you also understand it immediately. But if you think through all of the products which we are, which we are here, even the chemicals we use to clean the floor, in some shape or form depend on nature, right? And companies will get through this point of realization. And if you know the productivity factors increase in cost because they're simply uh, available in fewer in fewer quantity, then it will also hit them, right? So I think. You know, moving into a more sustainably, more renewably uh, economy is one which also will benefit them. It's not only cost, it's an opportunity also for companies. I think we had one question over there. If you are, I will.
Hi, thank you. Actually, um, maybe to follow up on that, I was just wondering, you mentioned also that this framework can be used for companies that are not necessarily producing um, a, a, like a product like coffee or chemicals, but also for professional services. So what does that um, analysis and planning look like for professional services companies? Yeah, kind of a tuna. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think you first of all have to consider kind of what is kind of scope three for professional services that it also include kind of the the companies that you, for example, advise or that you service with your professional kind of services that you're providing. But if we just kind of look, for example, at the office space that you have, there are still like tons of paper that is being printed uh, and sent out. And like, even if you just come to like a, a fair like this one, you produce emissions and you're going to have an impact because you are, I don't know, having banners and so on. So you always have something. It might not be always the most obvious thing, but also even kind of like the, the water that you use inside your buildings or like the chemicals that you use to kind of construct your building or office building or anything. So um, you, uh, the, the, every, like every single company does have an impact. For some it's very obvious, for others it's not that obvious. Uh, but this still doesn't excuse companies to say, I'm not relevant and I don't have to like deal with this. I like this example of uh, a company which moved into a new office space, right, which was built on uh, wetlands which have been dried out, right, and then in the winter, because it's an area it was in, in the US, right, uh, they were putting salt on the parking lot, right, to, desal also to, uh, to take away the ice, which then moves into the, uh, into the wetlands, yeah, uh, which is obviously uh, creating from sweet water to, to salt water. And this is not a, it's not, a, it's not a funny story, right? It's a reality. So the impact on nature is always, I had trouble to think it through as I said, but professional services is so far away. But it's basically, if you think it through, uh, uh, you know, and uh, including the clients you are serving, uh, you have an impact on nature and you ha also have a dependency on nature. And um, yeah, it's probably more indirect, but it's still there. Any more questions? I think um, the fear of uh, not having coffee in 15 years is going to be sufficient to drive enough corporates to, dr to go towards net. Uh, <laughs> Uh, nature positivity. Thank you very much, uh, Jerome and Ricarda. Thank, Thank you. you.